Okay, so there you go. That is our oil level using 87 octane after little, well, we'll get the exact mileage. I think we're a little bit over 3,000 miles right now. And today is September 11th. Our last oil change was, um, I'll have to check it again here, but basically this is our summer oil change. So you can see roughly where the full mark is and then where it goes over, we're roughly about a half an inch. Well, don't I feel like a horse's ass. I drained the oil and never collected a sample. This is my third video documenting my oil dilution problem with my 2017 Honda CRV. As of today, it has logged almost 74,000 miles and has never produced a check engine light or left us stranded on the road. My non-maintenance costs and repairs have been virtually non-existent. However, Reality meets perception, and the reason I'm making these videos and documenting my experience is to highlight the situation for drivers who are struggling with oil dilution, oil rise, smells in the interior, and receiving shrugs at the dealership. I will link in this video my first two videos highlighting oil sample results. As a quick refresh, my first video was done on an oil service with 5,450 miles from October 11th, 2020, to February 26, 2021, and I documented a nearly one inch oil rise above full utilizing 87 octane fuel, and in addition to those, I went over the oil sample results. My second video was on an oil service that was February 26, 2021 to June 10th, 2021, with 4,806 miles. And I exclusively started using 91 octane fuel after I changed the oil. And as the results show, I documented no oil rise in normal levels of fuel in the oil. To put to rest any questions this problem was related to cold weather only, I switched back to 87 octane for my summer oil change, which brings us to today's service. The oil service was from June 10, 2021 to September 16th, 2021, with 3,375 miles. 87 octane was used exclusively, and I documented a half an inch oil rise above full. It is slightly disappointing I forgot to capture an oil sample, as it would have dispelled any concern that I'm simply reporting an overfilled oil level. But I can assure you the oil level spot on the full mark hours after it was changed back in June. If I was nefarious or incompetent, I would have cap I would have put the captured used oil from my drain container into the oil sampling container and called it good. However, I'm curious about this car situation and correct reliable data is necessary to achieve legitimate answers and oil contaminated with my drain container with years of oil changes would have been junk input. Well, where do we go from here? So the purpose of these videos that I've put together was to document how effectively I was able to resolve my problem with oil dilution by utilizing 91 octane. This leads to the next question of, well, why do some people have this problem while others are reporting that they do not have this problem? And in fact, one would argue that there's a lot more people that don't have this problem than they are people that do have this problem. There's anecdotal stories that could go both ways. And just to have a little fun with this video, one could easily argue that the reason why most of these people don't have the problem is because they don't actually look at their vehicle. They don't change their oil. They don't check their oil. Their mechanic doesn't check their oil. They just drain it, replace it, move on. As long as they're not smelling fuel in the cabin, they're just fine. The people that do check their oil and maybe don't notice a problem probably could maybe be dealing with an oil consumption issue. 
And if you think about it, even a half a quart or one quart every, you know, five, 6,000 miles, most people don't bat an eye at that. That's actually, that's not that unreasonable. And it wasn't really all that long ago where it was very quite common. You would hear people complain about oil consumption every thousand miles. Could this be explained by simply stating that a group of drivers that drive a specific vehicle that don't pay any attention to the mechanics of it and or there is just a general oil consumption and the people that do have an issue actually have a vehicle or an engine that has no oil consumption. I'm not entirely convinced that's the, the situation going on. And I'm more convinced that what we're dealing with is different driving characteristics or different driving situations. So let's break this down into, everybody's got a different driving scenario. A car load of very heavy people, a car load of light people, a car driving into the wind, a car driving in 80 degree weather versus 75 degree weather a car under full throttle all the time, a car just puttering around with the brakes on all the time. You start to understand that these parameters, driving situations, there is a lot that has to be taken into account for it. And a lot of times if you talk to engineers, what they'll end up telling you is, is that they end up designing for you know 90, 95% of the situations. So you know, do they test their cars at 115 degrees? Do they test their cars at you know, negative 30, negative 40 degrees? And that answer, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that, you know, Honda did run advertisements in very far northern Minnesota where they showed the vehicles at the Baudette test track doing cold weather testing, which generally, you know, negative 40 isn't really out of the question for that. I think it's safe to assume that most manufacturers today are testing for what would be considered the extremes in the environments that are going on from hot weather to really cold weather. And the argument early on with these cars was, well, this was a cold weather situation that only affected, um, you know, the vehicles in Canada and then very far northern uh, states. While the initial data of that seemed true, there's also been anecdotal data where people down in Florida and Texas and California are reporting that, hey, we've got we've got oil dilution going on, too. My experience is that, yes, during the wintertime, we me personally, I see a lot more oil rise out of this engine than I do during the summer. But there's oil rise nonetheless. And I think what it comes down to is the in engine's thermal ability to deal with oil rise is greatly diminished in cold weather versus hot weather. But it doesn't change the fact that that engine at that particular um, situation is dealing with an oil rise. So why does oil rise occur in some vehicles but not others? Well, going forward, I'm going to assume that I am in the minority in that not all of these Honda vehicles are experiencing oil rise. Because if they were all experiencing oil rise, that would lead to another question with Honda and did they specify the right fuel for this vehicle? While we're on the subject of specifying the right fuel for the vehicle, what I mean is 87 versus 91 octane, usually that's thought of as in the performance category. High performance vehicles with, uh, say, programming that is on the upper end of the spectrum might require a 91 octane or a premium fuel versus everyday drivers are spec'd out at 87. From an engineering standpoint, I am sure the engineers would love to utilize 91 octane fuel. However, most consumers that are driving everyday Honda vehicles have no intention of using 87 octane. And in fact, if Honda came out and said, we have a base level CRV that requires 91 octane, I guarantee it would not sell because people don't want to spend more money on fuel than they have to. It's like toilet paper. You flush it down, it's gone, all right? So that leads to the next question. At what point does a manufacturer specify 91 octane versus 87? But I can theorize that there is actually quite a bit of, there is a line, and there is a line with the CRV on at what point does this vehicle need premium fuel? And I've suspected that whatever situation my vehicle operates in, I've crossed that line. Now, 
I'm going to also tell you a, a, a story. So in the late 90s when I was in high school, I purchased my second turbo vehicle, which was a 1992 Eagle Talon all-wheel drive turbo vehicle. This was my second turbo car, and prior to that I had a 84 Chrysler Laser that I blew the engine up by bleeding off the map sensor vacuum line um, in attempt to uh, jack up the boost on it. So I have at this point when I purchased this car, I had already a little bit of experience playing around with the turbo cars. And what I determined, um, long story short, I had an issue intermittently with this Eagle Talon where in the mornings it would have noisy lifters. And the noisy lifters would interact with the vehicle's knock sensor system and the vehicle thought it was knocking. So in the mornings, if I didn't let it warm up, the engine would have really doggy performance because it was pulling back the timing on this vehicle because it thought it was under knock. All because of a mechanical situation with the lifters. The car had 100,000 miles. The lifters at that time were known to be issues in these um, vehicles. And mine would clack until it, you know, reached generally operating temperature and then it would it would go on and work fine. So that what I'm why I'm sharing this with you is that this was a mechanical situation that was interfering with the actual engine management of the the vehicle that produced a performance issue. I have not put a scan tool on this to record how the knock sensor is interacting with my vehicle. To do that correctly, I would most likely need to have another CRV that didn't have oil dilution and maybe compare values. I don't know. I don't have the, you know, it's not like Honda's going to share with me the technical specs of what the knock sensor range should be at or when it's too long or does it come on too early or, you know, what whatever the case may be. But one of my theories with my particular car is that um, ever since I've owned it, it you know, when you start it up cold, it, it sounds clickety and clackety and, and I don't know, it's a noisy engine. And I've heard other people complain about this. And honestly, I think it's, I think it's part of the nature of this engine. However, I do have to wonder if this crosses a line. Does it cross a line where now it interacts with the, um, in the mornings where it interacts with the knock sensor and so, therefore, what ends up happening is the computer starts to control for knock. Now, beyond timing, the other ways that knock can be controlled is with fueling. And with the turbocharged cars, they can overfuel them. They can dump more fuel in to control knock. And there are documents on um, SAE, and I actually I'll send a link to it where it discusses knock, super knock, basically like low speed pre-ignition. We could go down a deep rabbit hole with that, and I'm not, by all means, I'm not a technical ex expert with knock. But one of the one of the reasons that I think my vehicle has problems versus someone else that's not reporting problems is that for whatever reason, my vehicle is seeing more knock. And it could be my driving characteristic. It could be where I live. Um, you know, we, we drive a short distance to the highway. And then once we're on the highway, we're going 70 miles an hour. When my wife leaves work, you know, she, she goes through town, ends up going through stoplights, but then, you know, it's 25 miles down the highway at 65, 70 miles an hour. So, is it a is it a driving characteristic situation? It very well could be, but I don't have the final answer on that. I only have theories. And so anybody that is scratching their head going, well, how do I fix this? Number one would be you're going to want to change your oil. And then you, to prove that 91 octane or premium fuel will fix this, begin using premium fuel. My experience with just switching premium fuel is that once the oil is contaminated, so to speak, once it's become diluted, it will vary a little bit in um, depth or in measurement on the dipstick, but it won't vary that much. You really need to change the oil and then change your fueling at that point 
switch over to a premium and then you will have a better result or better understanding of of truly what's going on. So for example, next time you have a service coming up, go change your oil or change your oil yourself, whatever you do. Then afterwards, begin fueling with premium fuel. You know, after 1,500, 2,000 miles, if you don't notice an oil rise and you're happy with it, then you understand that premium fuel will fix your problem. If it doesn't, then maybe you got something else going on. At the end of the day, if you do have this problem, change the oil, try a different fuel, and see if that solves your problem. But beyond that, there's no doubt that these little engines seem to provide some challenges. I don't know, it it, it makes the, the early 2000s look like the glory days for uh, performance and reliability. Uh, there's no doubt that there's a lot more performance cars now than there used to be. Put this into perspective, in 1992, my, my Eagle Talon all-wheel drive turbo car would do bone stock 0 to 60 in 6.5 seconds. And you know, at, at that time, it was a quick car. And what's funny about it now is that my 2011 Dodge Grand Caravan will do 0 to 60 in 7 seconds. I mean, th that just goes to prove how far performance has come along. I mean, with, with the Grand Caravan, it's by no means a performance vehicle. But when you put the pedal down on it, it goes. I mean, it gets out of its way and it goes. And it's it's a far cry from a four-cylinder five-speed minivan from 1988, which, you know, if you, if you were going 55 up a hill with four people in it, you were doing good. So that's my rant, and um, I just want to follow up and say that going forward, I really wanted to do an oil sample on this because you have watched my second video. You saw I had some slightly increased metal counts in that sample. Um, I, I think this sample would have been very telling, especially at the 3,000 mark. I am going to continue using 87 octane right now, um, and then we'll see how many miles I put on here. It could be the beginning of December before I'm due for a next 3,000 mile oil change. If you think there is value for me doing more samples, let me know what you think um, in the comments. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel. We've got a lot of other content besides oil problems in our Honda vehicles.